Okay, we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation for this afternoon. Um, Jeff Beck is going to be talking to us today about the short range weather application. Um, it is slated for release, hopefully, fingers crossed, in December. So this is just one other UFS application. Um, there are seven total, medium range weather being one, the short range weather will be the next one released. Um, so we'll hear a little bit more about that. So Jeff, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks, Jamie. See, I work at NOAA GSL on uh, uniquely uh, FV3 LAM development now. I did work development in the past, but for the last two-ish years, maybe a little more, we've been trying to spin up the FV3 LAM, which is known as the local area model version of the FV3. Um, and in UFS speak, it's going to be the short-range weather application. Uh, and um, I, I want to thank First of all, Jamie, for all of her help getting these slides together so we can talk about the short-range weather application release. And um, this has been such a monumental effort to get off the ground. There are tons and tons of people who are uh, taking part in helping us um, get the release uh, completed. So all of these people here um, are very important to making that happen, but there are many others that aren't even listed here. We just can't list them all. Uh, who are instrumental in helping us get the code ready, test it, get the documentation ready. So I just want to thank everyone for their efforts um, towards this end. So let's see if I can my mouse. So okay, so UFS applications are essentially configurations that support um, particular forecast requirements. So uh, this was touched on earlier by Ricky and a few others. Um, this is a cut and paste of a diagram from the UFS website that shows a list of all the UFS applications on the left-hand side here. And um, along the top, you can see all the different um, configurations that are available that are included in these applications. So um, all of them have an atmospheric and a land component. Uh, some of them contain um, other uh, models within, such as ocean, sea ice, aerosol, and wave components. And so, uh, similar to the medium range weather app, which uh, we've been focusing on during this training, uh, the short range weather app also contains the atmosphere and the land components. There is no wave component though uh, at the moment. So those are the two principal components that are in the short uh, range weather app. Um, and then each of these applications combine um, a number of components, including a numerical model, data simulation, pre and post processing, a workflow and other components. So in this case, the short range weather app consists of the numerical model, uh, pre and post processing, and, and a workflow. Uh, we're hoping to get data simulation and potentially verification in in a future incremental release or full release in the future. But for now, um, it's just a cold start system uh, with the model pre and post processing and then a workflow that goes along with it. Um, so the short range weather app covers uh, short range weather, uh, hence the name and convective allowing atmospheric phenomena that goes out uh, from less than an hour to several days. Um, I've been able to run it out maybe four or five days in, in a hurricane a uh, application, just testing it. Um, but uh, primarily it's really designed for uh, one to three day time spans, which is what um, most people are, are typically used to when they look at uh, NAM or HER or RAP data. And so that's what this uh, short range weather app is targeting. So um, this diagram here shows a list of all the uh, NCEP operational models uh, that NCO uh, manages on the left-hand side here. And um, going from left to right, you see a transition in time from different fiscal years starting from right now here all the way out to fiscal year 24. And so the whole goal here is that um, when NGGBS started, uh, next generation global prediction system, which eventually became the UFS. The whole goal was to consolidate their operational suite of models that are running uh, at NCEP currently, uh, just because trying to maintain individually all of these separate models and systems, oh, I'm sorry, I accidentally clicked that, um, is extremely difficult. And uh, it's, it's extremely onerous to try and maintain so many um, operations, so many systems and operations, and then try to create incremental upgrades to those systems is, is really difficult for NCO to manage um, and for the developers that have to work on all these different systems. So the whole goal is to consolidate around the FE3 die core and the UFS in the future. And you can see that's already happening here uh, with the GFS and the GEF systems. 
um, where we have a number of systems that are all getting bundled into the GEFs in terms of global aerosols, wave uh, ensemble, and the, uh, the, the weather ensemble itself. So all of these systems are slowly being combined under the UFS umbrella with the uh, FD3 die core. And uh, what you'll notice, at least for the global systems, is that once we get to fiscal year 24, all of them will be within this GEF system. Uh, where uh, GFS V17 will be part of the GEF system and they will all be uh, bundled together. And so something similar is planned uh, for the CAM or near CAM uh, deterministic and ensemble applications here in blue. So for those of you who are familiar with those, uh, they include systems like the SHREF, um, the, I'm sorry, uh, the HREF, the NAM, the RAP, and the HER. So the SHREF and the GEFs are, are near CAM, they're not really CAM systems, but the uh, convective allowing models really are uh, three kilometers uh, in resolution. And so those represent the, the NAM, uh, NAM HER and the, and the HREF. And so all of these systems are going to be subsumed by the FE3 die core and uh, the short range weather app or the medium range weather app if it's some of these near CAM systems. And you can see if you look down here in the blue, once we get near fiscal year 23, you'll see what's known as the RRFS which is uh, the rapid refresh forecast system is going to subsume uh, those high resolution models uh, like the NAM or the uh, HREF and, and the HER. And then by uh, fiscal year 24, um, all of these systems uh, should be under the same umbrella. So we'll have um, a coarser resolution GEF system, which is gonna be uh, FE3 based and then a higher resolution RFS system, also FE3 based. And the real goal Goal here for these uh, CAM systems is develop a, an ensemble DA and prediction system where uh, you no longer have separate ensemble and deterministic systems. You have a, a fully ensemble system that then launches uh, individual members uh, for longer forecasts, um, uh, longer than the typical hour cadence that you would uh, use for uh, your ensemble based system. And so you would have what you could consider deterministic members. Uh, that will be sent out for 18 or 60 hours in the future um, that would take the place of your previous deterministic system such as, as the, uh, the, the NAM of the herd. So that's, that's the real goal here. And the target operational implementation date is fiscal year 23 and the 24. So um, we still got a number of years to get this off the ground and to get it into operations. Um, we're currently working on uh, development of the RFS both at EMC and at GSL. Uh, we have a number of developmental uh, systems that are running in parallel so that we can uh, tune things, test the tuning, test the physics implementation, improve the physics, uh, work on an ensemble configuration because that's the ultimate goal. Um, and and we're, we're working in concert, uh, EMC and GSL. This is something that uh, we haven't had the luxury of doing in the past because uh, previously EMC was um, using a different die core. We were using uh, the WERF model at, at uh, Ezreal and GSL in Boulder, and uh, EMC was using the NAM, which is the uh, WERF NMMB um, die core. So we had not worked on, on things in collaboration nearly as much as we have now. So this is a really good outcome of NGGPS and UFS in that it's allowing us to work on a single die core uh, for the future of operational models that are in implementation in one step. So the RFS, Rapid Refresh Forecast System. So as I said, it's going to be an hourly updated system like the HER and the RAP and the NAM currently are. Um, and it's going to be ensemble based. Everything is going to be based on the FV3 local area version um, and uh, rapidly updating um, and at three kilometer resolution. And so what you can see here on the right is a uh, diagram in white of what we hope to be able to implement in operations at three kilometers for this RFS. So tests have already been conducted at EMC to ensure that we have the computational uh, compute power that we need. Um, and the reservations are available on WCOS based on my understanding from what Jacob has reported for uh, what essentially would be replacing um, the old uh, NAM and RAP domain, which is a North American domain but in this case, it would be running hourly at three kilometers. So this is a pretty heavy lift. This is a huge domain to run at three kilometers. This is something we could never have envisioned five to 10 years ago that this would be even possible. So some of the operational grids that you can see currently uh, with these other colors are represented on this diagram. Uh, we have a number of CONUS domains that are run uh, for uh, the HER and the NAM nest. 
And some of the products that come out of those are for air quality, for aviation. Uh, we also have to maintain uh, domains over Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Alaska, and Guam, which is which is outside of here. But um, this is also going to enable us to cut down on all of those different grids that we've had to maintain and run in operations, which has been extremely difficult to manage. So one large North American domain that covers all of these requirements is going to greatly simplify what we need to run in operations and, and will allow us to better develop the model code in the future. Um, so that said, uh, it's going to be an ensemble DA system. Potentially, it's going to be called RRDAS. I'm not sure what the, the name will be. Uh, eventually, it'll be run with what's called JEDI, which is the next generation DA system. Currently, uh, we're developing it with GSI, but with the goal of, of moving to JEDI as soon as it's ready, and that, that may happen in the next year or year and a half, I would hope, so that we can start developing with JEDI. And we would use an estimated 30 to 40 members for the rapid refresh hourly ensemble cycling. And then um, each hour, we would send out an estimated 10 members for free forecasts. Um, hourly, they'd go out 18 hours. And then every 6 to 12 hours, we'd send out forecasts 60 hours long. So we would get some of those long forecast hours, which a lot of National Weather Service uh, offices really are interested in, in getting more of the high-res information out beyond the uh, one to two day limit. So this is this is really ambitious, um, but it's exciting because this would be fantastic if we could get into operations by 2023 or 24. Um, so just some background on the limited area model capability. Uh, a lot of you have now, um, gotten up to date on the FE3 cube sphere grid based on uh, information that's provided um, previously by other presentations. Uh, it does use a, a mnemonic projection with great circles as, as the model coordinates, as you see an example down here with uh, a global configuration. Um, the six tiles cover the globe in total, and it offers a good uniform grid uniformity when you use them in a global configuration where your widest cell is only a square root of two wider than the narrowest cell on the grid, on the globe. But that's really only true for the six tile global setup. Once you try and, and create um, some refinement over uh, a specific area using what's called a Schmidt transformation and if you use nesting, then, then this kind of goes out the window. And so you've got a larger grid uh, deformity over your domain, which is really not what we would prefer to have. So I'll address that a little bit later. But uh, when the code was delivered from GFDL to EMC a couple of years ago or more, three years ago, um, a number of people, including Tom Black, worked on a, a capability to run it in a regional uh, fashion. And um, oops, okay. Um, they leveraged the nesting capability that exists on what's called tile seven, which you can see in the image here. Uh, to act as the regional domain. And then they removed tiles one through five since we don't need those anymore. Um, and this, this incorporates uh, necessary code to use uh, what's called a halo. So you've got a number of um, rows that go around that tile seven that would be uh, previously the tile six that are used for boundary conditions. And that's called a halo. And those are then transferred into the regional domain as you would typically for any regional model with lateral boundary conditions. Uh, and then tile six is just thrown out. Uh, we don't need the rest of tile six. We only need the halo values. And that leaves us uh, with tile seven, which essentially becomes the regional grid. Uh, this still allows for uh, Schmidt stretching of the mnemonic grid. So you can stretch and shrink your regional domain to any configuration that you wish. Um, and previously that was a problem when uh, we were considering, considering grid uniformity with the previous GFDL grid that we inherited from their code, uh, where you would have some grid uniformity that was less than optimal, um, spe specifically in the center of the domain. And um, I'll, I'll talk about that later. That's in another slide I'll get to. But um, that has been resolved, and I'll show you how we did that. But just in general, um, the short range weather app application, what does it consist of? It consists of the model, FE3 with the, the LAM version of the FE3. And it also consists of CCPP, which you've heard a lot about of um, already. And so that's a critical component to allow us to swap in and out different what are called suite definition files or different physics suites uh, that allow us to test uh, physics development uh, in different combinations um, that you can very easily swap in and out and, and test. And so uh, the short range weather app that we're gonna release, the first release is gonna consist of two 
uh, suite definition files uh, that I'll go into a little bit later, one targeted for a coarser resolution and another targeted for the future RRFS configuration. Uh, the application also consists in, of an end-to-end -end workflow, um, which has uh, pre-processing model execution and post-processing included. It also contains uh, a Rakoto Workflow Manager XML file. So for those systems that have support or have Rakoto installed already, the workflow will generate your uh, XML, Rakoto XML, uh, automatically based on configuration settings that the user sets. And then you simply launch the Rakoto workflow uh, on the command line. And it takes care of all the management uh, necessary to run your experiment from end to end. For those users who don't have access to Rakoto, who are, who are not on systems that haven't installed, we're also providing standalone scripts that allow users to submit each task in the workflow to the batch system. So you can still run the workflow uh, with these standalone scripts if you don't have access to Rakoto. Um, you just do it manually on the command line and we test it to make sure that that works correctly. Uh, the application also consists of extensive documentation uh, that is currently being developed uh, at DTC and uh, also by um, subject matter experts, um, people who are working on pre-processing, post-processing code. And so that will also be included in the release, um, both in the code repositories and also online at Read, Read the Docs uh, website. Um, there's also a user support forum available to people who run into problems or bugs uh, that uh, will allow you to uh, open tickets and ask for support from the community um, when you run into a problem. This is identical for all the different applications and the medium range weather app uh, is already taking advantage of this form uh, as you probably already know. So uh, the release teams, uh, there's a lot of release teams that exist for, uh, to get this ready. Um, the leads of the release teams include myself, Jamie Wolf, uh, Jacob Carly, and Curtis Alexander, as you can see here. So we're the four main leads on the release. Uh, they're trying to coordinate things at a higher level. Um, and then there are what we call focus teams. So below the, the leads, we have individual focus teams that work on different components of the system and the, and the application itself. So uh, we have focus teams specifically for the model code, which is led by myself and Lori, pre-processing led by Larissa Reams at NSSL, uh, the build system led by Mike, who you've heard he's helping with the training here as well, uh, the workflow, which I lead, uh, testing by Dom, uh, documentation and support forum by Jamie. So under those focus teams, we've got anywhere from 10 to 30 people who are participating to help us get to our goals that we need to meet in order to provide uh, a release that is uh, thorough, complete, and ready for the community. And so the, we've got participation from many, many groups here uh, from within the focus teams through DTC, uh, through many labs from NOAA, um, NCAR, and many collaborative institutes um, as well. And then there's also another component that is called the graduate student test, which you heard about. Ricky spoke about this earlier yesterday. Um, this is a test uh, that uh, typically graduate students or anyone who's new to the system really should be able to run in a timely fashion uh, to test the code and ensure things are working the way it should and that they can actually anal analyze the results. And so this is a system defined by the UFS release team, but it's also distributed by the UFS communications and outreach working group. So, um, Jamie, in particular, has been working uh, closely with UFS Communications and Outreach Working Group to make sure that we're ready for the graduate student test um, and that uh, it includes what we want. So that's an overview of the release teams. Again, it's, it's an extremely heavy lift, but uh, we've been working on this for many months, and it's really getting close to completion, I'm happy to say. So all right, so what are the, what are the goals of the release? Um, so this is the first release, version uh, 1.0. And so the whole goal is just to include an end-to-end -end system with the model, pre and post-processing, and a workflow to the community. Um, in the future, we're really hoping to get DA and a verification package, in this case, it's MET Plus, uh, into uh, future releases, releases. It could be an incremental release. It could be a full release. We'll just have to see what uh, the timelines are for those. Um, but the whole aim is, is to introduce the, the limited area version, the FV3, um, of the UFS in general uh, to the broader scientific community uh, and to provide the following features. Um, one is to be able to port easily to uh, many multiple platforms, and I'll touch on that later. Uh, we are currently supporting quite a few different platforms where users can run this on, um, allow users to run the experiments in the user-friendly workflow. So the whole workflow was designed from scratch 
to be as user friendly as possible and to allow people to easily configure their experiments, set up their workflow, and run the experiment fairly quickly and get results as fast as they can. Um, also to contain detailed documentation in the entire system so that people know and can, and can locate sources of information if they have questions or if they want to look in depth at a different component of the system. And then also support through the forum. So if users have problems with the code uh, or something unexpected happens, that they can go and, and find, find help for that and inform the community as well. So if there are bugs or problems that crop up that were unanticipated, uh, this will provide the opportunity for users to let the community know they exist and to let people within the community help each other, which is a really key goal here. Okay, okay so platform support. So where can you run this? Um, so we've got four different levels of platforms uh, with, with different amounts of support. And this is similar to a medium range weather app. Um, level one, which is the pre-configured platforms, uh, is the highest level of support. So this is uh, a systems where we've already installed the prerequisites in the libraries to run the system in an end-to-end -end fashion. Um, we've tested the workflow and the model build, so they will work out of the box without any um, changes from the user. And we've done comprehensive testing prior to the release. So these include uh, NCAR's Cheyenne machine, uh, NOAA's HPC machines, so Hera, Jet, WCOS, Cray, and Dell, and then the new MSU uh, Orion system. And so I should say we have two separate um, compiler support uh, systems right now, Intel and GNU. Uh, we hope to expand that in the future, but for now users will have the option to install with either of those compilers on any of the systems here. <clears throat> Um, level two is what we call configurable platforms. So the libraries and prerequisites are expected to install. Um, we haven't specifically tested those. Other people that we've been working with in the focus teams have, uh, and they've also tested the workflow and, and the model. So we expect them to run there. But again, we're not regularly on these systems uh, to confirm that they continue to run all the time. Uh, and then there will still be comprehensive, comprehensive testing prior to the release. And so again, we've got a number of people who work on these systems here, in particular Odin and Stampede. Um, and these are uh, primarily used by NSSL uh, employees and others um, that uh, have tested things there and, and told us that the model compiles, the model build, uh, runs, and the workflow works. And so we're hoping that that will stay that way. And again, we'll coordinate with them as we get closer to the release date and as we pass things off to the testing focus team. So level three, we're starting to get into what we call limited test platforms. So these are systems where we still expect the prerequisites in the libraries to install, um, and we expect the workflow and the model should run, but we've really done very limited testing here. And so this would include the Mac OS system, uh, Ubuntu, uh, Linux, and Red Hat. And so we've had a few people test things here, but this is by no means an extensive amount of testing. However, we do expect that with minimal efforts, you probably could get them to run there. And then the final, level is what we call build only platforms. So these are, again, where we expect libraries to install and the model and the workflow to build, but we've just not been able to get on these systems at all to run the model or test things. So this would include all generic platforms with the new compiler and then pre-configured uh, AM, AMIs on Amazon uh, uh, cloud essentially. So those, those are the four levels. And so we're doing our best uh, to get them up and running, and as you can imagine, with the, so many different components uh, involved in, in the application, and so many different changes, and the cadence of development that's taking place, it's extremely difficult to make sure that uh, we, we, we ensure that things are working on all of these different platforms, and so we're constantly having to um, tweak things and push PRs to ensure that um, essentially they're working the way we expect. But um, I'm confident that uh, we are nearing the point where we have support for all of these uh, and they should be ready for the release in December. So, so here are the, the domains and resolutions. So in the medium range weather app in the first release, you only had the option for a limited number of, of resolutions. And this is somewhat similar uh, in, in the short range weather app, although we do have, we do have um, a slight uh, advantage in releasing preliminary tools for users to define their own domain. So you will have a number of three uh, predefined domains here, three kilometers, 13, 25, uh, for the CONUS domain. So you can choose between one of those three. Now, if you wish to run over the Great Lakes or over your city, for example, 
you want a small sub conus domain, you can do that. But uh, these tools exist. However, they're currently used at your own risk. So they're not an officially supported component of the release, but they're there. So you can go ahead and try to create your own domain. You can, you can make a huge North American domain if you want. Uh, we have done that in the past, although they're not provided as predefined uh, domains for the release, but you can do it. Um, and so the one thing I wanted to point out is what I mentioned earlier, which is this move to what we're calling an extended Schmidt mnemonic grid. So originally the GFDL grid um, is a truly mnemonic grid, which uh, uses uh, great circles uh, as your, your um, for, to follow the, the, the grid points on the grid. And so what the, the unfortunate part about this, while it works great for global configurations, when you stretch things um, for a regional grid, you end up with something like here on the left where we have an example of a, of a CONUS GFDL type grid. And on the bottom, on the color bar, you can see that's the size of your, the distances between your grid points. So um, when you go from the edges of the grid point, uh, the edges of the domain, where you've got something less than three kilometers towards the center of the domain, where you've got something up to three and a half kilometer resolution, that's really uh, un unsustainable. Uh, you don't want that much variability in your regional domain. If you look in the middle here, this shows the variability in the HER grid. So this is the WARF ARW grid. And you can see we're really, really close to uh, a pure three kilometer difference across the full domain. So uh, we wanted to find a better way to create these regional domains. And so we worked with Jim Purser at EMC, who's fantastic with uh, grid configurations. And he discovered that there were a couple other parameters that could be taken advantage of in the GFDL grid uh, equations to produce a much more uniform um, regional grid. So the difference here is that we're deviating slightly from a mnemon pure mnemonic grid. So you're, the grid lines don't quite follow great circles, but what we end up with as a result is a domain where you have absolute uniformity across the whole grid. And this, this applies not only for CONUS domains, but even much larger domains which is excellent. So we, we have very little variability uh, with grid point spacing across this domain. It's even better than what we had in the ARW, which is fantastic. So we're really happy with this result. And so the grids that you use here, these predefined grids, if you use one of them, it will use what we're calling this extended Schmidt mnemonic grid option. So that's what you'll be using in the release. So like I mentioned previously, there are two physics suites that we're gonna support in the release. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink here. <clears throat> so the two suites that we're going to support is the current operational GFS V15.2 suite, which you can see listed here on the left in terms of what uh, the different physics components are included. And then what we're calling an RFS V1 beta suite, which is what we hope eventually will be implemented in operations in, in a future RFS. There are tweaks and changes that we're going to implement uh, later on such as uh, the gravity wave drag, we'll be moving towards a unified gravity wave drag suite. Um, and we're still working on the MYNN surface layer. Uh, there's some tweaks that need to be made there. Uh, what you'll also notice is there's no deep or shallow convection because right now at three kilometers, neither of those are turned on in the HER. And so for this beta version of the RFS, we don't anticipate turning those on. In the future, uh, once we have uh, scale aware uh, convective schemes that will be able to work in tandem with the MYNN PBL, uh, we anticipate being able to turn that on so that there will be some uh, shallow convection that's um, active in the RFS in the future, but that remains to be seen when that could happen. But for the preliminary release, these are the, the two suites that are supported. You can see for microphysics, we're going to use Thompson instead of the GFDL suite. Uh, but there are a number that are very similar here, the ozone and H2O. The land surface is nearly the same, except we're using the multi-parameterization version of NOAA, which is also an active development. So this should give you an idea of your choices when you want to run a um, test case in the uh, release. Now, it's important to note that the GFS suite definition file is really targeted towards um, non-convective allowing resolutions, so coarser than three kilometers. RFS is really for three kilometers and higher resolution. You don't want to run um, the uh, GFS scheme at really high resolutions or the inverse, the RFS at really coarse resolutions. That's not really what they're designed for, so. Okay, so the build system, how, how is this set up? So everything is CMake based. 
um, which is uh, extremely user friendly compared to what we currently we had previously. Um, and then we have a standardized platform dependent set of environment variables and modules that are used to build all the repositories with the same list of environment variables and modules. So it's much more uniform and standardized than what we had previously, where all of the repositories were using uh, you know, different settings, different uh, um, versions of Intel, different versions of Zlibs. So everything uh, is now uniform, and you source that information at runtime as well. So you use the exact same modules and environment settings at runtime that you would uh, when you build the system, which has made our lives a lot easier in, on the workflow side as well. Um, as I mentioned, we do have Linux and Mac operating systems uh, supported uh, for builds. And then we also have the option to choose between, for now, Intel and GNU compilers. And so we'll, we'll include other compilers in the future once we get support for those. Uh, there are some prerequisite libraries that have to be installed in order to build. Um, and so for the model preprocessing, post-processing utilities, you really uh, mainly rely on NCEP libs being installed. And so these have been touched on in previous um, presentations, but they're necessary for most of the components you need to run the end-to-end -end system. But many of these are already installed on the pre-configured platforms. So if you're using a tier one platform, even tier two, I believe, um, these will be available for you to, to use uh, out of the box. So you really only need to worry about this level of detail if you're looking at a tier three or a tier four system. Okay, so now I'll, I'll go briefly through what the pre-processing utilities are. So in the short range weather app, uh, we have a, a lot more uh, flexibility than in the medium range weather app uh, to do what you would want to do in terms of creating your own domain. So when you create your own domain, uh, you would either produce uh, the, the grid by using the new ESG code, which I mentioned previously, or the old make H grid, which is the GFDL version. So you have the choice of creating one or the other. Now, I'll, again, I'll mention these are unsupported, but available in the code for users to play with. Um, so if you choose the predefined platforms, uh, predefined grids, then it will use the ESG grid uh, to, to create the grid. If you want to create your own grid, you have the option to choose one or the other. And then once your grid is generated, then your orography gets uh, created. And then uh, it, we have a filter topo code, which will filter the topography based on the resolu resolution you choose. The higher the resolution, the more small scale filtering needs to take place. And then what we have, uh, what we call a shave executable. And the shave executable cuts off excess halo rows when you create the grid. So if you remember, you have the tile six, which is much larger, and then you shave it down to just three or four grid points outside of your tile seven regional grid uh, for your lateral boundary conditions. And so those are the principal pre-processing utilities for the grid generation and orography. Um, and then we have something called surface climo, which I believe George Gaynor uh, touched on briefly, although uh, these fields are automatically available in the medium range weather app. In the short range weather app, they are uh, built on the fly and they're specific to the grid that you choose. So this is essentially just climo fields um, for a lot of fields that you're not gonna have in your external model data. And Change Rest Cube needs these because FE3 needs them. And so a lot of uh, some of the fields that are created by the surface climo, which reads your grid file uh, to decide the resolution and where to create the fields are um, Max snow albedo, snow free albedo, vegetation greenness, vegetation type, substrate temperature, slope, and, and soil type. So a lot of these uh, variables aren't included in the external model data um, grid two files that you're going to find either online or on HPSS. So that's why we need this step here. There are some settings in Change Risk Cube that will allow you to use fields that are available in grid two files if they're available. And uh, you can do that, but that's a level of detail which we're not going to support in the first release for now. Uh, that could come later. And so once you've produced these fields, then you run change res cube, which is what reads in your raw external model data. Uh, in, in the uh, short range weather app, you can use either global or regional uh, external model data. Either will work. And then it also reads in the surface climo data uh, in order to create the initial conditions. So right now, we're supporting external model data uh, to create ICs and LBCs from either the GFS, the NAM wrap, or the HER model. So we've got quite a bit of variety now available. Uh, and we will probably add um, additional models in the near future. I know Larissa has added support for the UK MET model uh, for some of the hazardous weather test bed uh, cases that they ran. 
for the model they ran uh, there this past spring. So you know there, there are other models that we hope to get included in the future. But for the release, those these are the four that are, that are provided uh, for users to source. So you do the pre-processing, you run your model. I won't touch on the model because people have the models are essentially identical uh, between the medium range weather app and the short range weather app. And then we get to post-processing, which again is UPP and Tracy's gone over this in detail. So I won't go through much here except to say that it just takes your your native model grid. Um, which is in that CDF format and just converts it uh, to GRIB2 essentially and produces standard isobaric coordinate output. And uh, for the short range weather app, we have two components that are output in that CDF. We have these FIS and DYNE files, what we call them. So this is due to something called a write component, which takes the pure mnemonic output grid and remaps it to what the user defines. So if you want to use uh, rotated lat lawn or lat lawn or Lambert conformal, you have to choose one of those because UPP can't read, can't read the pure mnemonic output yet. And so this was implemented. So we have um, physics variables that are output in these fifth files and then dynamics variables in the dyne files. And then they're read into UPP and then UPP spits out the grid two files afterwards. And then also it calculates diagnostic fields that are not part of the model output. Um, that many users are interested in. And it also allows customization of the fields in the output file. So um, Tracy has worked on code that allows users now in the community workflow and the short range weather app to define their own flat file, which she talked about in her presentation. So you can set, create your new flat file if you want different variables or not as many variables. And then you point to that uh, when you set up your configuration for, the, uh, for your experiment. And then UPP will read that in instead of the default, and it will create the output GRIP2 files that you wish using the variables that you define. So again, just a, a brief high-level overview of what the, the Short Range Weather app consists of. We have the umbrella CMake build and compile uh, that allows you to, to build the code for the end-to-end -end system. Uh, we can then uh, have users create their experiment. Uh, we've got many customiz customization options available for users that are all contained within a single config file, which is a central location where users can define what kind of experiment they want to run, what, what they want to create for, for their experiment. Um, and we have a, a single script that then builds the configuration the user wants and then sets up the name list the way they should be uh, in order to run the, the application. Um, we have end-to-end uh, -end execution with task management uh, from uh, either a Rakota workflow, an XML, a Rakota workflow, or these standalone scripts uh, that go through and they, they execute each of those uh, individual executables that are necessary for pre-processing. Uh, then they run the model execution, and then they run UPP. Um, and then finally, we have also implemented some Python scripts uh, for basic graphics of UPP GRIB2 files. So these are um, fairly simple Python scripts, but very powerful scripts that allow you to um, plot, I believe it's 15 some variables uh, out of the box for your UPP GRID2 files for whatever domain. Uh, well, I should take that back. It's only really configured for the predefined CONUS domains, um, but hopefully we'll uh, expand that to uh, allow for other grids. Um, and there's also a difference script, the Python script, where if you run two different configurations using the same grid, then you can run uh, difference plots on them and, and uh, uh, figure out where things uh, differ between your two experiments. So these are, that's a really powerful tool for users to compare their experiments and their output to make sure everything looks the way they expect. So um, just to touch on the workflow a little bit, uh, the work on, on the workflow goes way back, probably almost as early as when we got the, the first code at EMC and at uh, GSL. And so Originally, back then, there were really two versions of the what we call now the FV3 LAM workflow, the workflow or the community workflow, and they were being developed in parallel and in, in separate. So UMC was was creating their own um, workflow for operational purposes on WCOFs, and GSL and DTC were working on a community workflow, which was a little bit more user friendly and really made uh, for retrospective cases. Um, so that we could test the FV3 LAM. And you know, the whole goal of the UFS in general is uh, that community and collaborative efforts are fundamental to the advancement of the science. And that goes for the UFS as well as the RFS. And so 
we decided that since we're going to be working on these uh, this effort together, that it makes sense that we merge these workflows. And so we keep the best of the EMC workflow, which allows uh, NCO mode, which is NCO is a very specific configuration that they require to be implemented in operations. But we keep the community and the flexibility aspects of the GSL and the DTC uh, workflows. And so we met almost a year and a half ago now, in the summer of 2019. You should see a picture up there in the upper right-hand corner at NCAR, where we met in a room. Uh, we had participants from DTC, MC, GSL, and NSSL um, that were present. And we worked out what the requirements would be to be able to merge these two workflows and to keep the requirements of each intact. And so over the following half year to year, we worked on incorporating both of all the requirements necessary and ultimately ended up with a single uh, flexible, expandable experiment and workflow generation tool that can be used in both operational and in research environments. So the user has the option to either run in what we call community or NCO mode. And so you can either run it in a, a normal community mode where you would run a retrospective case or if you'd like, because you're in integrate or you're um, working on development of the code that you're eventually hoping to get implemented in operations, you can run it in the NCO configuration to make sure that it works the way that it should when it would be ultimately uh, implemented operationally. And these options can be invoked at the workflow generation time. So again, in that configure script, which contains all of the user-defined variables to run your experiments, so you just say, you know. Uh, community mode or NCO mode as one of the user defined variables and, and the workflow scripts handle everything else uh, afterwards. So what's the workflow look like? I've been talking a lot about uh, this configure script. So it's, it's really a single location where the user sets all of the applicable variables and settings for their experiments. You set the date, you set the domain, you set uh, your external model data, you set the location of where it's sourced if you want to get it. Uh, there are many, many, many different settings that you can uh, apply, and they'll be included in the documentation so that users can see. And we have a number of templates that are available, so users can simply copy uh, a template to the config.sh file and then modify it for their own configurations fairly easily. And, and it seems to be fairly user-friendly for people who are getting spun up on the workflow for the first time and they're running the FD3 LAM for the first time. We've gotten really good feedback that it, it's, it's fairly straightforward and fairly easy for, for people to pick up. So we're, we're really glad to hear that. So once you've created your config script and you have all the settings uh, correctly defined for uh, the experiment that you want to run, then you just issue this generate FV3 LAM WFlow script. And so this goes through and it creates your work directory, it creates your Rakoto XML file uh, that you, you would run. And then um, if you don't have these, then you can also uh, run the standalone script. So you're not forced to run Rakoto if you don't have it installed on your system. You can simply run these standalone scripts uh, at this time too instead. Um, so we've got uh, a slew of different uh, error checking modules that are included in this generate script. Uh, there are a lot of uh, pitfalls that a user can, can run into if they're not familiar with the FE3, with the grid decomposition rules that have to be followed, certain specific rules have to be followed based on your NX and NY values in for the grid size and the number of grid points and, and the layout, how you uh, decompose the grid uh, for MPI. So we check all of those. So if, if someone is creating a new grid for the first time, uh, this script will tell you if your grid decomposition is going to work. And it, if it doesn't, it'll tell you why. And it'll tell you what you need to do uh, to tweak your domain size, your layouts, to make sure everything is, is going to work and the, the model is going to run correctly. Um, so the other option that I wanted to point out is that uh, the workflow also allows users to stage their external model data if you have it on disk, if you've uh, sourced it manually, or uh, it can go onto HPSS on uh, the no HPC platforms if that's where you're working and automatically pull the data based on the date that you give the config file. Um, the other advantage of the workflow here is that if you want to run it in retrospective mode, you can. If you want to run it in real time, you can. So if you're running in a real time environment, you only need to create the grid and the orography and those surface climate files once. You really have no interest in running that on each cycle. It's just a waste. And so you can easily set those tasks to none or no in the config file, and they won't get run. Um, 
Now, if you're setting up something for the first time, here is the uh, list of workflow tasks. And so what you'll see here is that the first three tasks are only run once, even in a retrospective mode. So if you set this up to start off as a cold start run, and then let's say you've eventually got DA set up and you, you no longer need to do anything with um, the grid or the RFE, the surface climo. So they, they're run once and then they're done. And so you can, you can set as many cycles as you want in the config file. If you wanna run it for a year, you can set it up to do that. And it will, it will continuously cycle. Um, and it will start from steps four through nine here. And so uh, after you've gone through those first three steps of the grid orography and the surface climo, then uh, for every new cycle that it runs, it will source your ICs and your BCs. And um, I'm sorry, it'll source the data for your ICs and your BCs. And that, that could be you know, cold start data, that could be uh, restart files, that could be uh, you know, your, your, your DA output from GSI, for example. And then it makes the ICs and the BCs make ICBC, which is the change rest steps to create your initial and your lateral boundary conditions. Then it runs the forecast and it runs post. So this is the, the core components of the workflow. Uh, we've tried to make it as clear as possible to explain exactly what the workflow is doing. And again, you've got log files that you can, you can look at uh, after each step that gives you lots of information. Um, that it will help you uh, debug problems or if you run into something that you're not expecting, then chances are the log file is going to tell you exactly why and you can troubleshoot that way. Okay, so uh, the grad student test is another component of the release which is critical to the su success of the release itself. Um, and similar to the medium range weather application, uh, this will be released with a specific test uh, that's for the 15th of June, 2019. You can see an example plot of that uh, on the right-hand side here, uh, the surface uh, map, and then uh, one of the output fields from the Python scripts. And the whole goal here is to illustrate the code availability and the development processes to the, to the broader community. And you can assess whether a student can do all of these uh, easily in under six hours. The whole goal is of the graduate student test. You should be able to get, build, and run and change the code and test the code for correct operation. Uh, you should evaluate, be able to evaluate the code with standard diagnostic packages and locate documentation and user support or training if you have the need for that. And again, you don't have to be a graduate student to run this. You can be anyone new to the code. Um, it's just a, just a nomenclature thing. Um, so uh, again, the, the short range weather app SGST is using the severe weather case as a default. Uh, and it also allows users to swap out the physics suite and resolution to test uh, one or the other. So you either have a coarse resolution with the GFS uh, suite definition file, or you have a finer three columnar resolution with the RFS beta suite definition file. And then you can visual, visually compare a number of the output fields through the, the Python scripts that I've, I've already discussed. And you'll be able to fill out a questionnaire about the experience and, and provide feedback uh, to us to let us know how we're doing. And so this is coming really soon and it'll be a great opportunity to get involved. There'll be a way to register and uh, that should be going out uh, to a number of mailing lists in the near future. So um, part of that component is again, user support. And uh, there uh, are three ways that a user uh, can, can get help more or less. Uh, one is this extensive documentation. And we have documentation for every component in the release uh, including the, the weather model itself, all of the utilities uh, for pre-processing, uh, for CCPP, for post-processing. And these will all be available either within the repositories and online, so you can get them in multiple locations. Um, these Python GRIP2 scripts are really gonna be good for people to plot and evaluate their, their output to make sure everything looks reasonable, to make sure the forecasts look reasonable. Uh, and then to plot difference graphics if you try to change your experiment and you want to see how that differs in the new run, you can do that too. And then finally, we have the forums, uh, which there's an example of the web page here on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, where users can um, get input from subject matter experts, but also other people from the community who've already tested and, and run the code and will hopefully contribute uh, to the forum as well so that um, we can share the knowledge as, as widely as possible. Uh, but that's that's really the ultimate goal of the forums is to build knowledge within the community um, and, and not really make it a one-way thing. It, it should really be two-way where we've got 
many users who were contributing to the forums, who were providing information, who are letting us know of bugs that exist, and then other users who can provide workarounds or, or have tried configurations that maybe other people are interested in and, and other people can, can uh, source from. So, okay, so for the release, what, what do the app uh, code repositories look like? We've got six of them. And so the one you'll start with is what's called the umbrella repository, which is similar to the MRW weather app umbrella repository. So this sits on top of all the other repositories and submodules below, and it uses managed externals to go and check them out and grab all the different um, components. So it, it once you download that repository, then using managed externals, it will go and check out the weather model. It'll check out the regional workflow code, um, UFS utils, and EMC post. Now, NCEP libs is a little bit different because uh, for platforms that don't already have that installed, users will have to go and grab that manually. Um, but like I said previously, on tier one and two, those should be ready to go, and you can point to them uh, if it hasn't already been done, since they should be ready to, to source. Um, all components are public in GitHub, and we encourage posting of issues and submissions of, of pull requests for people who are actively developing the code or have interests in contributing to the UFS. Um, we also have wiki pages on uh, GitHub that will help you get started. Uh, and particularly, I'd point you to the wiki page of the Short Range Weather app, which has information on how to uh, check out that uh, repository and uh, build the code and, and run the workflow. And so finally, I'd just like to stress the importance of joining the UFS community. Um, it, it's, it's critical that people provide and conduct scientific research by running the code and analyzing their output, and then providing feedback to the community in general through the forum through presentations and publications. And that's the ultimate goal of the release. We want to provide this tool to everyone in the community and then hopefully spur contributions back from the community uh, into the UFS itself and potentially even into operations, which would be fantastic. Uh, please report any bugs you see uh, via the forum uh, and ask and answer questions that are there. Not only ask, but also answer if you see that uh, there's an opportunity to do that. Take the graduate student test and evaluate the model code and, and the release itself. And then for those of you who are in universities or um, other locations where uh, you're interested in, in uh, funding opportunities, there are a number of UFS R2O uh, funding calls that continually roll out uh, that you could take advantage of. Um, and that would be fantastic to have more contributions from, from people in the community. Um, you can participate in the DTC visitor program. So we offer a visitor program in DTC where you can apply. Um, normally, you would you would come to DTC in Boulder uh, and spend a couple weeks or maybe a couple months. Uh, you can also do it completely remotely. Um, if you're working on a project that's related to the goals of the DTC, I would encourage you to, to check that out on the DTC website and potentially apply. Uh, please read the UFS and DTC newsletters for more information on the releases in the near future. And uh, feel free to attend the UFS users workshop. So, I led that uh, with Weiwei uh, this past summer, and uh, from what we've heard, it was an absolute success. Even though it was all virtual, um, people seemed to get a lot out of it. A lot of great presentations on all components of the UFS, uh, medium range weather app, short range weather app, aerosols, uh, wave, everything. And it was, um, it was great. Um, and then please feel free to develop code uh, in one or more of the components and open issues if you have a new technique uh, or functionality that doesn't exist, um, you can always open an issue and request it and, and or uh, develop code yourself and then open PRs as well. That's definitely encouraged. And then finally, just looking forward, um, there's continued development of different UFS applications, many of which are undergoing rapid development. So we expect to see major changes and new functionality uh, coming online uh, regularly in the near future. But in addition to the short-range weather app, there'll be a number of future releases that are, will be coming up uh, very soon, including the S2S -S app, uh, the Hurricane app. Uh, and then there'll be incremental development work and releases that we hope to include in, in the short-range weather app in the future uh, that would include data assimilation and, and uh, the verification capability like I discussed with Net Plus. So look out for those in the near future, potentially an incremental release or a full release in the next year. And Cadence is about every year, there would be a full release coming out for each of these applications. And so we're, again, just to summarize, we're really looking for 
uh, contributions from, for the community and from the community to the UFS uh, to really make this a community-based modeling system. And that's all I have. So thank you all. And any questions? Great. Thanks, Jeff, for the overview. Um, I, for one, am really looking forward to this release going out the door. So I hope it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hope others find it uh, useful and exciting as well. So uh, I don't right now see any questions in Slack. Um, does okay. anybody want to unmute and ask anything? Um, I do. This is Sharon. I was wondering, um, have there been any decisions made about the vertical, vertical coordinate choices for some of these operational configurations? You didn't really speak about the vertical coordinate. Yeah, that's no, that's an excellent question. And uh, we've been working on that um, at GSL in concert with EMC to come up with an optimal vertical coordinate configuration for the, for the future RFS. And the goal here is really to take the best aspects of the NAM vertical coordinate, the GFS, and the HER, and create a hybrid between the two where we can create um, really high resolution in the boundary layer, as high as we can in, in the mid-troposphere, and then very high resolution with the tropos tropopause for aviation aspects. Um, and so uh, that's nearing completion, and we're working uh, directly uh, across laboratories to try and make that happen to come up with the best of, of both worlds. Seems like there's nothing left that somebody doesn't want resolved. <laughs> so yeah, it's tough to please everyone. Lots of levels, yes, thanks. Yes, yep. This is Christiane. I, I have a question concerning SIEM. So, you know, we, in the practical sessions, we have been using the SIEM workflow, and this is the Rokoto uh, workflow. I was wondering whether there are, in the future, any tendencies to merge these two? So that's been an ongoing discussion um, for a long time now. Um, there was multiple, there were multiple methods uh, that began at the beginning of the UFS to, to handle the workflow component. So there's something called Crow, which is also developed at EMC, and there's Seam uh, at NCAR, and then this regional workflow at, at GSL. And uh, there are ongoing discussions about how to merge the best uh, components of each into a potential future uh, unified workflow. Uh, now, you, we do have to point out though that um, a lot of these workflows, a lot of these applications uh, cater to very unique and different um, functionalities and requirements. And so a one, one workflow to rule them all is, is a very difficult um, goal to try and achieve, but we are, we have a, a workflow working group. Uh, we have a Slack channel for that, uh, where we are trying our best to, to come up with a potential way to, to merge uh, at least the best capabilities of each of these into some future unified workflow. So it remains to be seen, excuse me, it remains to be seen whether uh, we'll be able to fully unify a single workflow for all applications. I think that, I'm not sure that's possible, but uh, we definitely do want to try and incorporate the best uh, functionalities that we can from each of the, the, the different workflows. Do you think the Hurricane app has the same workflow as the, um, the S? Well, the, so the, they, the, they have they have a separate workflow which is Python based, okay. and they were they were involved in the workflow merge that took place at NCAR. So we got feedback on how they uh, organized their workflow, and they got feedback on how we are organizing the workflow for the regional app. And um, so we did have some information exchange and, and we incorporated a number of their components and, and vice versa. So um, so yes, they, they have a separate way of handling their workflow as well. Okay, thank you. I, yeah. I would expand on that just briefly and say that while the workflow manager may be different for each of the applications, the way the executables are called for each of the components is we, we are trying to unify that. So, you know, um, if there is a utility that is used between uh, in the medium range weather app or the short range weather app, the way that's called from either of the workflow managers should be able to be consistent. So hopefully we can uh, unify in that way at a minimum. Any other questions? A 
Okay. Well, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that overview. Sure. Um, at this point, we'll jump back over to the Google Meet and do our last practical session. Um, so again, this time we'll be focused on session three, which was uh, mostly on the post-processing. Uh, if you've already done that section, if you want to play around with any other um, changes, modifications, please feel free to do so. And um, if you run into any problems, definitely um, ask some questions on Slack and we'll make sure that uh, we answer them there. So uh, thank you very much and we'll see you over on the Google Meet.